Hello there, I'm in Tetbury in Gloucestershire, a town that makes the most of its close proximity to Highgrove, Prince Charles's home. And today, His Royal Highness is a special guest on the programme. He'll be talking about the persecution of Christians in the Middle East and the radicalisation of young Muslims here. The secret is we have to go on despite the setbacks and despite the discouragement to try and build bridges. And I'm in Brixham in Devon to uncover the inspiration behind the adopted FA Cup anthem, Abide With Me. And I'll discover how the vibrant sound of gospel took the 80s by storm. And there's a fantastic range of music for you to sing along to if you want to from all over the UK, including a performance by the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra and the Huddersfield Choral Society. But first, we begin with a hymn of praise. For over 20 years, Prince Charles has been involved in interfaith dialogue in an attempt to promote understanding between faiths. Late last year, he visited Christian communities from the Middle East resident in the UK. With today's news stories often highlighting religious hostility, persecution and tension between faiths, I'd like to know why His Royal Highness believes that bridges can still be built. Um, Your Royal Highness, why did you decide to visit the Armenian, Chaldean and Syrian Orthodox churches? And can visiting really help? Well, I, I particularly wanted to show solidarity, really, and deep concern for what uh, so many of the uh, Eastern Christian churches are going through in, in, in the Middle East. And, I mean, what... What can I do except try to show concern and sympathy and understanding? I just felt that one way to do that, because I know that so many of them, having been to visit their congregations, have uh, members of those congregations where their families are still out in Iraq or Syria or wherever, and are either being persecuted or killed or in some awful way 
badly treated, to say the least, driven out of their homes. And I just felt that it was very important to show that sympathy for, with them, but also in a, in a way that might draw some more attention to their plight, which is so utterly appalling when you think uh, how long Christians have been in the Middle East and that Christianity, of course, was founded in the Middle East, which we often forget, exactly. I think. People sort of lost touch sometimes with this. I can't imagine what it would be like to be separated from my family and not to be able to see them again. It just, it's unimaginable. But I think what doesn't bear thinking about is that, apart from anything else, people of one faith, you know, a believer, could, could kill another believer. That's the totally bewildering aspect in, in our day and age. You know, you've been doing this for 20 years. You know, you've been, you know, after 20 years of really trying to build bridges between all these different faiths, do you feel a bit discouraged with the current situation? Well, inevitably, I, you know, I find it heartbreaking that these sort of things should happen, particularly when I know that, in many ways, there's never been more activity going on, you know, with interfaith dialogue and endless efforts made to bring everybody together, to remind us all of our shared common Abrahamic <laughs> roots and origins. But that's the tragedy. But we have to remember, I think, that all that effort is going on. It's just that we are left at the moment with these, uh, these appalling extremist uh, activities, which, which are disrupting everything and inevitably setting back to a certain extent all the efforts, but at the same time, we have to remember that in Bosnia, I suppose 20 years ago, enormous numbers of Muslims were massacred and persecuted, raped. So it isn't just Christians, but I, I personally mind about, you know, persecution and ill treatment of anybody. Yeah. But I think the secret is we have to work harder to build bridges. And uh, we have to remember that our Lord taught us to love our neighbor, to do to others as you have them do to you, and just to go on despite the setbacks and despite the discouragement to, to try and build bridges and, and to show justice and kindness to people.
Well, we'll be back with His Royal Highness a little bit later on in the programme to continue our conversation. But first, if there's one style of music you know brings hope, it's gospel. And Connie's on a journey into the story of black British gospel. Last week, I discovered how British black churches sprang up between the 50s and 70s. They initially kept their gospel music inside the church. But as author Steve Alexander-Smith has been telling me, that all changed in the 80s. The main group that really took gospel music in Britain to another level were the London Community Gospel Choir. As set up by Basil Mead back in 1982. The choirs are coming out of the church as it is and are taking the music into secular places where people who don't normally go to church can hear gospel music now. He was also, at the time, making a political statement. Black culture, youth culture, was seen as negative. There's all the negative press. Basil was saying, oh, hang on a minute, we've got something to offer. But not everyone agreed with this change in direction. Some Pentecostal churches didn't sit well with bringing in certain type of instruments, like the drums, if you like, that was more associated with pop, um, rhythm and blues, rock and roll. Either it was church music, music that was sacred, or it was the music that was out there, the devil's music. It was as simple as that. The late 80s saw the arrival of American gospel acts like Andre Crouch and this group, the Winans, touring the UK. Their intricate vocal harmonies gave inspiration to young British singers who'd rarely heard music outside their own churches. Well, I do remember one in particular where an internationally famous choir were coming across the Winans, but we were having our convention on the same day and we snuck out to go and see them. Everything's gonna work out just the way. In the 1990s, gospel got even bigger. All of a sudden, gospel music was on TV, it was on the radio. My choir, the Kingdom Choir, was everywhere, doing a lot of high-profile stuff. I think it brought about an acceptance of, of gospel. We are meant to take the gospel outside of the four walls. I, a strong believer, I don't think God or faith can be boxed inside a church. Next week, I'll hear about the transformation of British gospel in the last decade. <laughs>